Dear friends, uh, thank you, Mark, for this uh, presentation, which was very long, <laughs> and uh, maybe you, you, took, you took a lot with. And, uh, but I must admit, uh, after listening to you that uh, talking about cultural diplomacy, I didn't really start to think very much about that uh, until very recently. Well, although I have been a, was a diplomat or, or minister of foreign affairs for nine years, and uh, of course I have always seen myself trying to use diplomacy, I have not thought very much about cultural diplomacy. So that's what I'm learning now and learning from you, and I think that is very important to think of diplomacy in, 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 in that way, because when I think back, culture has helped much more than I have uh, thought of. And I can see now how useful culture can be to solve very difficult problems. But uh, let me tell you a, a little bit first about the Nordic region. Uh, you can see that it's a, it's a big region. It's uh, only a region of, of uh, 25 million people. But it is a region of, of, uh, of eight time zones coming from Finland and, and all the way to, to, to Greenland. Greenland is actually 20, 20, times, oh, 20 times bigger than, than Iceland. And Iceland is actually two and a half times bigger than Denmark. But uh, Denmark is the ruling country in, in in Greenland. But uh, the problems between Greenland and uh, the Faroe Islands and, uh, and Denmark have been solved with autonomy. And that was the same for Iceland in 1918. Iceland got an autonomous status, uh, but got independent in 1944. And what was the, just to tell you, what was the first country to, you would think of that would recognize Iceland's in, independence in 1944? One would assume that it would be one of the Nordic countries. It was not. It was the United States. And it is not very common that the United States is the first country in the world to recognize an independence of a, of a, of a new country. And what was the reason? The reason was that the United States came to Iceland with its army, and it was the first move of the United States into the war in, in, in Europe. In, uh, that was in, in 1940. It was before Pearl Harbor. It is sometimes said that the United States came into the war in Europe first after Pearl Harbor, no, they were in, in Iceland before to release the British, to help the, the, the British because the British needed their forces elsewhere. Well, I promise not to speak for a very long time, and as you know, politicians are used to, uh, now I'm not very good in, in moving this. Oh, it's left and right. This one. Okay, that was it. And, and, and this is uh, what I just wanted to tell you in the beginning, uh, that the Nordic countries, we are 25 million people. We have eight different ofi of official languages. When I was the Secretary General of the Nordic Council of Ministers, uh, the official languages in my office were Swedish, Danish and Norwegian, and uh, I s spoke mostly Danish, but uh, I'm educated both in D Denmark and Norway, so, and I have learned Swedish. <laughs> but some are saying that they are very similar languages. Well, they are, and we understand usually each other, but if I start to speak Icelandic to the Danes, they, they don't understand anything. And I don't understand Finnish at, 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 at all. But it is said that we will be moving into English, but uh, there is a lot of resistance to, to that. But we have this, these 
eight time zones I, I, I spoke of. But believe it or not, these countries together are, are the 10th biggest economy in the world. And one can ask, why on earth is that, that 25 million people are the, 20, are the 10th or maybe 11th? It has been some question of the 10th or 11th. I, I think uh, the main reason is that they have been working together and uh, joining forces together in, in many areas. And uh, they have been able to, to stop talking about history all the time. When I was in school in Iceland as a, as, as a boy and as a youngster, we learned a lot of bad things about the Danes. How the Danes behaved when Iceland was under, under Denmark. We were taught to dislike the Danes. And that is a terrible thing to do. What, what can we get out of that? That uh, what the Danes did in Iceland 100 years ago, nothing at all, because the Danes behaved also badly against their own people 100 years ago. It was a, it, it was a different world. And uh, this is something we have, we have of course, learned. History binds us to, together. Uh, once we were under both uh, Denmark, Iceland, Sweden, and Norway were under the Queen of, of, of Denmark. And there has been discussion on that we should move so far to becoming one state. Uh, this, was, this will not be done in, in my lifetime. Maybe that will happen somewhere in the future. I, I doubt that, and, uh, but it doesn't matter. And of course, when we look into the past, uh, culture has played a major role in, 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 in our, 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 our history for, for centuries. We have Nordic values. We have Nordic identity, and we try to try to preserve that. And that is, of course, very true that the freedom of, of speech and the and democracy is very much linked to the arts, to literature. And if you have freedom of speech, you have also to have freedom of of arts and freedom of the artists to express themselves and to take part in, in political discussions. Uh, and, and that is what we have been used to in, in, in Iceland, that many of our writers, I will mention Haldor Kilian Laxnes, for example, he, has been, he was criticizing politics very heavily. We have writers today who are criticizing politics. Uh, Haldor Kilian Laxnes got the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1955 and uh, has written a, a lot of books. But in one time of his life, he was a great admirer of the Soviet Union. Of course, we didn't like that. But should we judge Haldor Tillian Laxness just because of that? No, I, I don't think we should. And, uh, and uh, I will come to that, that later. If we go into our formal cooperation in present time. We have a, a Nordic Council, which is the Council of the Parliamentarians. They have a, a lot of meetings together. We have the, then we tried to get a Nordic internal market in 1970. We failed, and actually we got the internal market through the European Union and the European Economic Area. And out of that, come came a formal governmental cooperation in 1972 with uh, 11 formal ministerial councils, other informal, and uh, one of these councils are, are Council of, 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 of Culture. And culture is, when we look into this, is, is the very backbone in our, our cooperation. We have cultural houses. We have, for example, a cultural Nordic house in, in Reykjavik in Iceland. We have a very big one in, in the Faroe Islands. 
and we have another big one in, in, in Nook in Greenland. And uh, these cultural houses in, in Greenland and uh, Faroe Islands play a very uh, important role. It doesn't play the same role in Iceland because we have a lot of new cultural houses and, and this is actually the newest one, Harpa, which is a, 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 a both for music and, and opera, designed partly by, by the Icelandic Danish artist uh, Olavur Eliasson, who has been working, I think, a lot here in, here in Berlin. And uh, we have a cultural fund, we have a film and TV fund, the, the most important films and, and TV programs coming from the Nordic countries are supported by this common fund. And then we have many cultural programs. Uh, and if I look back, one can see that culture has always played a big role in it, both international and multilateral cooperation. Of course, this has changed because the European Union, uh, it was, Denmark went into the European Union in 1972, Sweden and Finland in 1995. There's a discussion now on Iceland is going to join. I, I think Iceland will join someday, but it, it is not the right time now. There has been, uh, there has been uh, some problems in, in this discussion. That has, of course, all this has had a great influence. The fall of the Soviet Union ha has had a, a, a big influence in, in the Nordic countries and, of course, globalization. Uh, but what I wanted to tell you that what has changed in the Nordic countries in recent decades is that we have changed from being very inward in our cooperation in going to outward. Of course, each country is a player of, of its own, but we have found out that we are stronger together and can do a lot of things together. We opened offices in the Baltic countries in 1991. And actually, we opened these Nordic offices in the Baltic countries before uh, the Nordic countries opened embassies in, in the Baltic countries. I was at that time a member of the Nordic Council for Parliamentarians and was leading the liberal group at, at, at that time. So I came very often to Riga and Vilnius. Or, or, in, 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 in that time, and it was rather strange for me to, in the parliament, for example, in Riga, to have discussion, discussions with, with Russian generals. And uh, it, was also, it was also strange to meet parliamentarians from these countries and saying the Russians has to get out. And when I asked them, well, are you talking about also the children, the, the children or Russians that are born in, in your countries? Yes. This is impossible, I, I said to them. But then the answer is, you don't know what they have done to us. Of course, the Russians have done terrible things in these countries, terrible things. But uh, I think uh, now we have a much, much better situation, not think, we have a much, much better situation 30 years later. And one of the reasons for that, that they are much better off, is the strong cooperation the Baltic countries have had with the Nordic countries. Uh, we opened also an office in, 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 in Russia in 1995 in St. Petersburg. I was actually then a uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs and, and we, we succeeded in, in having an agreement with the Russians on, on that. And then again we opened in 2005, I think, in Kaliningrad. Uh, and we have been utilizing these offices to 
scatter battle cooperation, not only with the Russians, but also helping the cooperation between Russia and the Baltic countries, uh, because sometimes they are not on very good speaking terms. And culture is, 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 is always used in, in, we have a, so a Nordic Baltic mobility program, which is very much on, on culture. It is all, also very much on exchange, on students, helping students, helping officials to work in, in, in the Nordic countries and, and get, get the training. And uh, we have also increased very much our cooperation in foreign policy and, and security policy. I can mention the, the embassy here in, in, uh, in Berlin, which is a, a beautiful building or buildings where we have a, a common Nordic embassy and working very close together in our cooperation with, with Germany. We have also very close cooperation in many international organizations. We have been working very much now on, on Arctic policy and, and, and the culture in the Arctic area. This is a huge area, as you can see just looking at Greenland, but it is, it is also a huge Arctic area in, in Russia and in Canada. And uh, we are in common forming a, a, an Arctic policy and working closely to, to, together. All the five Nordic countries are members of the Arctic Council, and the three other countries are Russia, the United States, and Canada. And this is actually the only regional council in the world where both Russia and the United States are, are members. And uh, when we formed the Arctic Council in 1995, if I remember right, I was to the first meeting in, in Canada as a Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, at that time under the, under the leadership of, of Lloyd Axworthy. We, d we were not aware of how important this was going to be. But now the Arctic is getting very important. The Chinese, they want to come in as an observer. They will, the Koreans as, as well. Uh, so there is a, a great interest for Arctic policy and uh, Arctic affairs. Uh, I just wanted to, 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 to mention what we are using in our diplomacy, in, in our cooperation. The cre creative industries uh, are, are getting very popular. And then we are realizing how the ties are big between businesses and arts and culture. Nordic design, Nordic, Nordic food, Nordic architecture. Uh, this, this is something which shows how important culture, how important backbone it is in, 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 in our uh, societies. And that can, of course, be utilized in cooperation with other countries and also learning other countries to, to use this in a more systematic way. Now, we, we have also Nordic events. We, we, we had something we call the Nordic Cool in, in February in, in Kennedy Center, where we put together uh, exhibitions films and uh, symphony orchestras and so on and so on to present the Nordic countries to the United States. And this was a very big event, which was financed mostly through, through our office in, in Copenhagen, which I was leading until, until March this, this, this year. So, so, so this is what we, 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 we are trying to do to, 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 together. A little bit about the challenge. Uh, to start with, 
core Nordic values like democracy, tolerance, gender equality, freedom of ex expression is what we build on. And, and, and we think of ourselves that we have a global responsibility to, uh, to promote these values through the United Nations, through the European Union, through NATO and, 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 and others. Uh, this is not only for our, ourselves, we, we have the responsibility to talk about these, these values in other parts of the of the of the system of, of, of the of the world. The welfare system in our countries is very famous, but it is it is uh, challenged. We are getting older, like many populations of many other countries. The health system is getting more expensive. And we have to try to do everything to have uh, get it more effective. And it is very important to research into that. And uh, now we are seeing much more that culture, in a way, can have a big influence on your well-being. You are more happy if you, if you can... Uh, go to <laughs> listen to music, go to opera and go to theater, uh, especially for the elder generation, the, 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 the culture is very important. And it is quite clear that they are more healthy and more happier if they are able to, to take part in, 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 in cultural life. Uh, we are, we have been a very homogeneous society, but it is quite clear that there are a lot of people coming into our societies. And uh, we hear more about religious, cultural and, and lingual diversity. And, and this is something that can be dangerous and can create conflicts. And uh, this is a challenge we are facing and we have to deal with. These people who are coming into our societies are very important to us. And uh, we have to receive them in a good way and help them to adapt to our so societies. But this is, of course, a... Uh, 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 a challenge. We uh, want to look uh, on ourselves as, as sustainable societies and uh, culture is of course important in that sustainability and therefore when we are talking about sustainability we are also talking about the links of culture to, 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 to that. Uh, urban planning, architecture, and design is also, in my way, a, a challenge. Uh, I would like to tell you a little bit about Iceland, and maybe I've been using too much time, uh, because I'm coming from Iceland, and uh, tell you a little bit about what is happening there. Uh, we are, I think we, it would be very difficult for us to be a, an, an, an independent, as we see ourselves, independent and strong democracy without the Nordic cooperation. We are a people of 325,000 people, far in the North Atlantic. And uh, <clears throat> of course there, is, there are difficulties to, of, of, of being there. But we have been able to, to uh, utilize the situation of, of the country. We have daily flights to many cities of, of, of Europe. We have also daily flights to many cities in North America, to New York, to Boston, to 
to Washington, to Minneapolis, to Seattle, to Denver, to Toronto, to Halifax. I, I think it's very unusual for such a small country to have that kind of network. And, and, and that is, of course, very, very important for us. Literature has always been a, a, a very uh, important uh, f factor in our society, all the way from the sagas. The, the sagas are telling us so much about our past, about our culture. Think of that, for example, that you can read in the sagas when an uh, Icelandic man discovered America, Leifur Eriksson, in the year, year 1000. And many would say, well, this is not true. How can, you, how can you know that? These sagas were written 200 years later, and we don't think they are very accurate. But uh, proof have been found on, on the ruins of these people in Labrador, and also facts that uh, they had been traveling more south and, uh, and uh, producing wine. And they couldn't produce wine from the ice. They had to get to some, 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 some berries. And, and the sagas are also telling us that there was a lady, Guðröður Þorbjarnardóttir, who led a, a voyage to North America. And uh, the first uh, uh, baby born in <laughs> European, we could say, the first European born in North America, was her son, Snorri, and then she traveled back to Greenland and then came to Iceland. And then she went on a pilgrim after that to Rome. And one can say uh, she probably was the most traveled lady at that time in the world, traveling both to North America just after 1000 and then traveling to Rome. And, and one could ask, well, is this really true? Well, anyway, there, documents on her stay in the Vatican has been found in the Vatican. So it is not just the, 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 the sagas. And uh, poetry has, of course, also been very, very important. And uh, we look up on the, the, the Edda, almost as important as the works of, of Shakespeare and, and, and Homer, but they are not as well known as, as, as these uh, works. Iceland, Icelandic nature, Icelandic culture, and for example, the, the, the film industry are playing a major role now for Iceland, Icelandic tourism. Uh, Icelandic tourism, are now up to 800,000 people this year. There will be 800,000 tourists in, in Iceland. A population of 325,000 people are getting 800,000 tourists. And we think it will be in 2020 about one and a half to two million people coming to Iceland. There's a lo lot of, of, of reasons for that. I think culture plays here a major role. There are more and more films taken in Iceland than ever before. Uh, this year, uh, there will be, like Noah, which is, uh, will be coming, and, uh, and, uh, and more films that are taken up in, 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 in Iceland. And this has a, 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 a big role in, 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 in our life. I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about the, 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 the sagas. It is the first enormous body of prose in, in, in a European language. And uh, the literature influence is great, but has been very limited because of the isolated language. And uh, this is uh, 
Mediterranean lit liter literature. It's about laws. It's about it's a testimony to human spirit's ability to meet fate and 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 and, and learn from it. You can read a, a, a lot there about the value of loyalty, friendship, power of poetry. For example, it is very famous for one, one man who was to be killed by a king. But the king said, if you come with a great poet in 20 verses, in the next, next 24 hours, I will save your head. And this poetry is very famous, so called uh, Head Ransom. And he created this poet, and uh, he got, could walk out as a free man. This is a, a, a lot about uh, frictions between generations, about sorrow, about grief. It is about independent farmers and, and their struggle with, with even kings. It's about defending its honor, be it uh, a foreign king or a, or, a, or, a, or a fellow countryman. A lot of this was, was written by a man named Snorri Sturluson, who lived in 1178 to 1241. He did most of this, and then he was killed by his own countrymen under influence of the Norwegian king. So th th there's a lot of struggle, a, a lot of wars, and a lot of killing in these, these sagas. So it, it shows us that the, 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 the Icelanders and the Nordic people have not been very innocent people all the, all the time. This literature has had a great influence on Icelandic literature. It has also had an influence on, on, on many, many, many international uh, writers. Now we can say uh, 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 this can be used much more, should be used much more, for people to learn from, and how we have come from into what we are today. I mentioned Haldor Tilia Laxness, I, I, I could also mention Gunnar Gunnarsson, who is actually a, a, a famous writer, coming for, from the some, same small place as I am coming from in, in Iceland. And think of that, he, he, he went to Denmark only 18 years old, and he did write world literature, not in his own language, but in Danish. And actually, Halldor Tila Laxness, uh, he translated his Danish writing into Icelandic, and Gunnar Gunnarsson translated Halldor Tila Laxness' writings into, 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 into uh, Icelandic. But Gunnar Gunnarsson had his main market here in Germany. And... Uh, it is maybe a bad part of his history that he even met Hitler. And he came to the German front to, to read for, for the German soldiers. Should he be judged out of that? Some people have done that. But Gunnar Gunnarsson was, was, was not a political figure. He was just trying to sell his books, and, uh, and uh, he thought it was good to meet... Uh, Adolf Hitler to be able to sell more books in Germany. That was all. And when the British came to, to Iceland, Gunnar Gunnarsson had built a farmhouse in the eastern part of, of, of Iceland, and he moved actually from Denmark to Iceland in the, in the beginning of the war. And I think that was very important for him, because I think some of the resistance people in, in Denmark could have killed him just because he met, met Adolf Hitler. Anyway, the Danes, uh, Danes resistance, they killed one Icelandic artist in Copenhagen on peace day, and that was because of a mistake, a misunderstanding. But they killed him, and nobody was judged for that. So, 
it is quite clear that that uh, uh, all this ha has had a gr great influence. But now the Icelandic sagas have been published in, in English. Uh, they have also been, uh, now they are being published in the three Nordic languages. A new version is coming. And uh, and some of them have been, were, were published here in, in Germany in, in 2011. But I'm sorry to say, not all of them. But I hope that uh, they will, will all come also in the in the Nordic uh, languages. Uh, this uh, th one is coming in, in next spring in Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. It's 2,500 pages. So it's, it's a lot of literature. It's a, it, it, it is a lot of, 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 of good writing and something that, that can be utilized, in my, my view, much more. Well, I, I think I should talk a little bit about the future. It is quite clear that these tools can both offer tools and methods, uh, both for identity building. That is something we have done in the Nordic countries, two common goals and understanding. And uh, it is quite clear that it can also be a basis for economic growth. And uh, we have to work on all these spillover effects of the cultural sector on society at large. And I think, I think we can do very, very much more about it. Actually, and I have to say something in the end on, on, on that. I am coming from South Korea and actually came into Berlin very late yesterday night, just before midnight. And I was traveling for 20 hours from, from South Korea with eight hours time difference, so maybe I look a little bit strange. But <clears throat> I was listening, <laughs> trying to learn from the Koreans. I was uh, listening to the new president of South Korea, Mrs. Park, and she was talking about trust politic. That is her main issue now, trust politics. And she said, we uh, have to do small things, start with small things. And this is very good that the president of South Korea has this policy because there is a lot of need in, in, this, in this, this area. There, there are a lot of tensions. The Chinese are saying, the Japanese, they should apologize properly. The Koreans are, are saying, they, the Japanese should apologize properly. And uh, this uh, rhetoric is then used, I would say anti-Japanese rhetoric is used in, 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 for example, in Korea to win, uh, to win uh, domestic support. And uh, uh, there is quite clear uh, uh, a lot can be done and they need assistance. And of course, uh, they have also to think much more about the day that the regime in North Korea will fall down. That day will come. And it is necessary to prepare for that. One can discuss if Germany was prepared enough for, for the unification in, in, in 1991, wasn't it? Uh, this day will also come in, 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 in Korea. I came to the border just two days ago, and we tend to forget what happened in this area. There were four million people killed in, in this war. There is, a, there is a fence, I think it is 147 kilometers, and there is a guarding post with 200 meters difference, all with 
lights. They use a, a lot of electricity to, to have these lights. Because it, if you're flying over Korea, there's, there are a lot of lights you see in, in, in South Korea, but you see nothing in North Korea. There is a difference, like we would say, between heaven and hell. So, so this is a, 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 a terrible situation. And there are many innocent people. There are many young people who will, who will be living another life sometimes in the future. And there's a need to prepare them. There's a need to, to educate them. There is a need to invite them to come to, come to conferences and, and, and so on. So I see a, a, a very great need in this areas, in this area. This is a very growing economy in this part of, world, of the world. Japan, China, South Korea are all some of the biggest economies in, in the world. They don't have very good cooperation. Japan and South Korea, they have in common that they have uh, United States as a, as a close ally. They don't want to have very much Chinese influence, but the Chinese are going up and their influence is growing. And I, I, I think we who are coming from other parts of the world, we can do a lot to, 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 to help in this area, to share with them our experience share with them how we have put the past away in a, in a, we are not we, are, we we don't look on the past as as a, as a great burden for example here in germany the 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 second world war is not a great burden anymore in history but all these wars in 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 asia between the invasion of, of, of Japan, both into Korea and into China, is a great burden. And uh, this has to change. It is not easy. And uh, it has to change in, in that area like it has to change in the Balkans, where we, we did see terrible things not very long ago. But... Uh, Excuse me that I have maybe been talking a little bit longer than, than I in, intended in the, in the beginning. Uh, I could give you a new lecture on my experience now in, 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 on my trip in, 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 in Korea. I was there with my former colleagues. We, have, uh, we, have, uh, we are coming together maybe one or two times a year under the leadership of Madeleine Albright. And she is a very effective lady, and we are very proud of working together with her. And uh, it, is a, it, it is a tremendous learning process for, for me, uh, now learning about the situation in, in, in Asia. Last year, learning in, in uh, Marrakesh about the situation in the Middle East, Iran, and, and, and all that. But, we, we need also to, to look at the situation elsewhere in the world. It is not enough just to, to work on the, on, the, on the Middle East. We, we have a role to play in, in, in other parts of the, of the world. And I think we can do much more than we realize ourselves. But thank you once again, and, and thank you for inviting me here to, here to Berlin. It is, a, it is always a great pleasure to, 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 to come here. I came to Berlin as a Minister of Fisheries for the first time in 1984, I think. Then I saw how it was here in Berlin, the, the wall, and I went over the, to East Berlin. I came here in, 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 in January 1989. Nobody was talking about the fall of the Berlin Wall at that time. Then I came in January 1990. I saw what had happened. I came again in January 1991. And then I saw that most of the ruins of the world were, were, had been taken away. 
So things can happen much, much faster than we, we, we know. I remember I was once at a seminar in, in Britain about West and East Germany, and there was one man who said, I can always remember this, he said, I think something will move, or maybe some kind of unification after 2030. That was the, that was the only year I had ever heard before it happened in 1989. It happened, mostly because of the fall of the Soviet Union. And of course, such things can also happen in, 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 in Korea. I hope so. And such things can also happen in the Middle East. For example, if there will be an agreement with, with Iran, it's a very much hope, because Iran has a lot of good people. I have been there and met some of the young people of Iran. They, in, I, I think they have a fantastic young people in Iran and can do a lot of things if they can just, just use their talents. And we have to do what we can to, to help this. But I would very much like to answer some questions and, and hope I have not taken too much of your time. <laughs>